mention when I was making the announcements that uh, Phil and Marsha and Terry is at home this morning. Uh, they've been exposed to COVID as well. And uh, to be safe, they uh, elected to, to stay home and watch online. We have a lot of a lot of our members watching online, and you know, it's times like this when we have the weather that we do, when we have the pandemic that we're having, that it's wonderful that we're able to come together as a family and still worship, even though we're not in the same building. We're able to worship together. And you know, that's exactly what we're commanded to do, is to worship together our Heavenly Father. And so even though we may not be able to be in the same place from time to time, we can come together at the very moment that the church is worshiping and worship in spirit and in truth with our Heavenly Father and our congregation. Most of you know that if you've ever been in the house that Nancy and I are in, the parsonage, uh, you will see that uh, we have uh, quite a bit of art, or Nancy has quite a bit of art on the walls. We've got uh, a lot of uh, woodworking stuff uh, sitting around in our house all over the place. Some of the pictures that are on the wall in, a, in the house uh, were painted by my aunt. I think I have about five or six pictures that she painted before she passed away. And she even, in one of the pictures, painted my last name on the mailbox. So it is a personal item to me. That is a personal painting. You know, back several years ago, in one of our... Nancy and I's first uh, trips to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge area, we were driving around in the back country and we went into one of the smaller communities and uh, we drove by uh, a store and outside this store a man had a tent set up and he had a lot of wood stacked outside of it, but he also had some carvings, and he was taking his his chainsaw, and he was cutting uh, black bears, and it was the most gorgeous thing that Nancy and I have ever seen. As a matter of fact, we didn't buy one that particular trip, but we did buy one on another trip there, and we still have that bear, black bear in the house sitting around. You know, at the beginning when this guy started cutting this, this uh, bear out of this log, um, it just looked like an ordinary piece of firewood. But it eventually became a work of art. And some of these men, and even women over in that area, are very uh, skilled at drawing or cutting out certain figures. I know that I'm nowhere close to that. But these artists, and I call them that because it, they are an artist when they're taking something, by the definition, they take something that is not the, the thing, uh, they take a piece of wood, let's just say, and from that piece of wood they can, they can visualize what they want to do to it to make it come alive and be something. They are an artist in all sense of the word. The art begins with that picture in their mind. And then the artist, little by little, takes that piece of wood, either by a chainsaw or by a knife or whatever, and carves away the wood until eventually it becomes a work of art. Think about that. Because in a manner of speaking, that's exactly who you and I are as a Christian. Because when we come to God, we are stained, we are filthy. And little by little, the, the stain of sin is cut away. Because, And I say little by little, it's because we don't know everything when we first become a Christian. 
But as we grow as a Christian, as we learn what we are to do, and we repent and we change of those things, we, we carve off or we cut off the, the negative things. And eventually, the great picture of a Christian occurs. Now, that's what I want to remind us. That you and I are fearfully and wonderfully created. And then I want us to think about what we need to stay this way. There are two texts that I would like for you to go to. Or you can read it here. The first text is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Where the Bible says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, He created Him, male and female. He created them. Now, I don't want to be disreverent or irreverent to God by any means in, in, in how He created man. But when I see these artists taking a piece of wood and carving out something beautiful, that's how I see God creating you and I. Because He takes something that is not perfect and He makes us perfect because we are in Christ. The next text I want you to look at is Psalm 139 and verse 14. Where David, David is in this chapter and it's a wonderful chapter to, to read. But in Psalm 139, David is, is letting you and I know of God's perfect knowledge of man. And in verse 14, he says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. The two words that I want us to look at briefly is the word fearfully and wonderfully. The word fearfully has the idea and meaning behind it that we are to fear God with reverence. There's, it's a dual definition, fear God, but fear God through the reverence that we have for God. The other word is wonderfully. And that word has the idea that something is set apart. You and I, man, are made Wonderfully, to be set apart for a certain service, a certain thing, to serve God. We were created by God in God's image. Each one of us are beautifully made as we enter this world. But just as the bear, that if you leave it outside after the artist cut, uh, carves it out and paints it and does his staining to it, if you leave it outside, this, this work of art will eventually become weathered because of the weather elements. That's how you and I can become if we allow it. We can be weathered because of the world, the elements of the world. But life can be restored to this wood bear by taking the, the the bear in the condition that it is and clean it up and stain it again and, or put some kind of stain on it or, or oil on it that brings out that beauty of that wood once again. That's how you and I can be once again. By looking at ourselves compared to the Bible and taking off the dirty, the dirt, the sin. So what I want us to talk about for the next few minutes is how or what we can do to make ourselves beautiful, spiritually speaking, again. The idea here is that if I want to renew in 2022, I need to carve away the bad so that I can restore the good. Now we we get things stained in our life again when we mess up and we sin or as we are learning. And sometimes some of the things that, that 
that involves is the personal deficiencies that, that we have. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back and let's read verse one, uh, chapter 1 and verse 27 again. God created man in his own image. Now, I want us to think about that word image because that idea is from the image that God had for you and I, he created us. And the idea is that something was cut out or something that was molded from nothing because God created us from nothing. Now, the idea of that artist in Gatlinburg, he created something he had an image in his mind and he created something, a statue from a, a, a piece of wood. But God made us. God created us. He formed us in the image that he desired for us. So what do we need to do? There comes time when we need to carve away the personal deficiencies, the things that make us bad. So that the good will once again shine in our life. In Titus chapter 3, and beginning in verse 3, Paul writes these words. This is how we become dirty once again. He said, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. Passing our days in malice and envy, hatred by others and hating one another. That's not a very good description of who a Christian should be, is it? Someone that is foolish, someone that's disobedient, someone that's led astray, someone that is slave to various passions and pleasures, someone that is hated and hates others. So what, what we need to do is see these deficiencies that we have, if we are uh, 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 having any of these, and cut those away. Look at verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, He saved us not, by, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing and the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. The key is verse 8 is that Paul is wanting us to uh, believe in God and to devote ourselves to good works. In other words, carve away the deficiencies that we have so that the good will shine through. And these things, Paul said, is, is profitable and is the great thing for you and I to do. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, wrote these words in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 6. Leave your simple ways and live. Walk in the way of insight. Walk in the way of the Lord, friends. That's what we need to do. I want you to consider the parable that Jesus spoke of the two sons, two sons in Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, we have this parable of the two sons. And, and the father goes to the two sons, and, and uh, beginning in verse 28, he came to the first, and he says to the first son, Son, I want you to go to work today in my vineyard. The son answered and said, I will. Oh, excuse me, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. If I'd ever said, I'm not going to do something what my daddy told me to do, I may be in false teeth right about now. All right? But here's a son that the father comes up to him. He says, I want you to go to my vineyard. He says, I will not. But yet, later, he 
he says, you know, that was wrong. And he went and did it. Then he came to the second son, and like he said likewise, and the son answered and said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And the answer was, surely as, uh, the, they answered Jesus, said the first one. And I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom heaven before you. And the reason is that John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. In other words, when you saw it, you did not take away the personal deficiencies that you had. But these people, the people who understand where they are standing in view of eternity, the, the tax collectors and harlots, these people, they understood it. They started cutting away the bad. Maybe it's that sometimes we believe those who teach error. And, and, and because of that, that dirties our image. I, I want you to look in, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 8 because in that, that Jesus carefully, carefully says, See that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and this is the time at hand. Do not go after them, Jesus said. So it may be that when we start to follow something that, or a person teaching something that is not right, and we see it, we need to cut away that deficiency. But when we start cutting away the old, so that the new is being revealed, Paul says we have been set free from sin. And it's the sin that we are cutting away from us. And we do it because we realize who we serve. And as, as Paul wrote here, he says, we are slaves to God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Why do we cut away deficiencies? Is so that we can have life eternal. So we may need to cut away deficiencies in our own life. But we also may need to cut away the world. The world, you know, the world has a, a way of really grabbing a hold of so many of us. And when I say the world, it's not just worldly things. It's things that are in the world, the, the negativity of things in the world. And it gets us down as Christians. We, we allow the pandemic to get us down. We allow this or that to get us down because it's in the world. We quit trusting in God. Friends, that's, we... We need, if we're going to feed, defeat this, this virus that's going around, if we're going to continue to grow as a church, we need to quit trusting the world and trust God more and pray to God more. We need to carve away the world from our life, maybe even from our congregation. This week is my wife's birthday. I'm not going to tell you how old she is, but if you ask me later, I'll let you know. And so I wanted to surprise her this week. She has always said that she wanted to go to Pigeon Forge to go to the Smoky Mountain Murder Mystery Dinner Theater. And so I called up this dinner theater to inquire about the shows, the, the plays that they uh, that they had. It's 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 a play, and and they. They act it out on stage while you're eating, and they, they get the, the people in, in the audience to interact with it. And it sounded like a pretty good time. But when I called about the play, the response I got from the operator was, all the plays that we have are adult content. And I immediately kind of got a little upset because I knew she wanted to go somewhere, to go to this. She's always wanted to go there. And so I wanted to take her. Now I can say, you know, Nancy and I are an adult. We can handle whatever adult conduct, come, uh, content comes out of this play. Uh, I'm not going to let it affect me because, you know, I'm an adult. But what if someone sees me going into this play? Someone who knows 
what this play is about or what this company is about. And they know that Nancy and I are Christians. And they know that I'm a preacher. You may say, well, maybe that nobody sees you that way. God does. God would see me going in. And I know what this play and what this place is all about. Can I be sure that if I decide that because I'm an adult, I can go in and not be tempted? Friends, temptation hits every one of us. And so there is no way that I can say that I can prevent myself from being tempted. Nor would I ever want as the husband of my wife to be tempted in a place or cause her to be tempted and very possibly fall to temptation. So the best thing to do is not go to this place at all. And I'm not patting myself on, on my back by any means, but I think that that's something that we all need to consider. Pull ourselves away from worldly things. I believe that's how worldly things creep into the church is that we put ourselves in those situations. And we do that even in our own homes with television. In John, uh, John chapter 15, in verses 8 through 16, Jesus lets us know that we are known to by others of our lifestyle. How we act and how that we uh, talk and, and uh, places that we go, it lets people know what we are and who we are. And when I told the lady on the phone that I thanked her for her time that I would not be buying tickets, uh, I, I, I knew that in her tone it was like, I can't believe you will buy a ticket. I would much rather go to heaven than go to that, that play, that movie, the, that uh, dinner theater. Here, here's another thought, and, and this crossed my mind too. What if Jesus comes back while I'm sitting in there? How could I ever explain that? I've always said this. It's always safe to do the safe thing. Don't put yourself in a place where you're going to be tempted. Go to two different other verses. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's read verse 2. In verse 2 of 1 Timothy 6, Paul writing to Timothy says, Those who have not believing master, masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers Rather, they must serve all the better sense. Those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. In other words, Paul is writing to Timothy to preach that we act the way Christians are to act. Even if we have non-believers, non-Christians that we work for, that we are all uh, that we are in, involved with, or, or we come in contact with. Let them see Christ living in us. Look at verse 20. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. That's the congregation. Christians. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm entrusted those that, that are part of this congregation to other Christians that I'm in, uh, that I'm able to go and, and to see and, and maybe even privileged to preach at. But the elders here are entrusted with the members of this congregation. And, and Paul wrote to Timothy to guard the deposit entrusted to you. And, and that's what God is entrusting to the elders. Guard them. As a husband, as a leader of my home, I've got to guard my home. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. People can disguise error and call it knowledge. And the church and Christians will fall victim to that. 
we can convince ourselves that it's not nothing wrong to go to that play or, or to go to that R-rated movie or to go to a place where there's language that shouldn't be used. But why would I want to put myself in a position to lust and to, to be tempted and possibly sin? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul wrote to abstain. What's that word abstain mean? It's very simple. Do not do it. Stay away from it. Notice, abstain from every form of evil. If we as Christians and the church would just use that verse as a guide, our homes will not fall victim to different things that are coming in the home through the media, through the television, through the radios. Abstain from it. When you see it, it's not right, click it off. Turn the channel. Why? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we see the biblical concept. You were dead in trespasses and sin at one point in time. Each one of us were dead in sin. And that's what we see in verse 2. In which you once walked you once lived following the course, here it is, the course of the world. So friends, it may be that we need to cut off the world. We need to carve that away from our mind and our hearts and our life and our home. And finally, this morning, we may need to cut away ourselves. The problem is, is that we serve self many times. And when we serve self, God is not put where He needs to be. Where He deserves to be. He rightly deserves to be placed first in our lives. I am very pleased with the people that are here today. I'm very pleased with the people that are watching online today. Because what you have did today is made that decision that God is going to be first today. We are commanded to worship on the first day of the week. And I am so grateful that you decided this day that you wanted to put God first. Peter wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter 4, the first three verses. He said, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Think about that for a moment. Jesus suffered in human flesh. How did He suffer? Well, think about all the times that he, he suffered as He was on His earthly mission. Where people tried to attack Him. And then when it finally happened that Jesus was denied, Jesus was, was betrayed, Jesus hung on that cross, He, he was he went to a trial that was a mock trial and he was beaten, spit upon, slapped, mockly worshipped. Paul Peter goes out and he says, For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. There it is. Don't have that desire to live the rest of your life in the flesh, but do it for God. I've actually had a man tell me one day, I was encouraging him to get back to worship and you know, come back to church and help the, help the work of the church and everything. And he said, he, he said, you know, Jeff, I understand what you're saying. He said, one day I will. One day I will get myself back in church and I'm going to be the best worker that congregation has ever seen. One day I will be there. You, will, you just wait. You'll see me. To this day I haven't seen him. Peter writes, live the rest of our times in our flesh, not for the passions, the human passions, the worldly passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past 
suffices for doing what is the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel is preached. That though they, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does or the way God wants us to. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God, very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that everything may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Maybe we need to call away self. <coughs> A while ago, I made mention that, that uh, Jesus was all the things that he had to go through. But there's one other thing I want us to, to think about. When the Jews were convinced to kill our Lord and Savior, we're told in Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 26, that the people cried out, for a robber and a murderer instead of letting Christ go. Christ had done no sin. But Barabbas had, was a murderer. He, he was a robber. And he was in jail. But there was at this time there was the right for one to be released. And the crowd was convinced to ask for Barabbas instead of Christ. And the question was asked, well what do you want me to do with Christ? Crucify him, crucify him. These people put themselves first. And that's the reason why on the day of Pentecost, when the first sermon was preached, those that understood the guilt and the problem that they caused by having Jesus crucified, they asked, what must I do to be saved? No one will ever be able to remain pure and clean. Just as we go outside and we play and we work and we do different things, our physical body gets gets filthy and we have to come in and, and wash that that body. When, when I was younger, as a, when I was a young boy, my grandmother on my mother's side loved to uh, pick on me. She liked that commercial uh, I'm, I'm think, I think it was Jif, not Jif. It was a, it was a hand washing or hand soap, and she loved to pick them. Wash your hands, Jeffrey. Wash your hands because that was in the commercial. You remember? Wash your hands, Jeffrey. Mother would always ask when I'd come to, "Did you wash your hands?" Yes, ma'am. I didn't wash my hands. Why was everybody so worried about me washing my hands? Well, my mother didn't want me to get, get sick from germs. You see, God doesn't want us to get sick with sin. And that's why He's made it a way for us to get clean spiritually. Through obedience of the gospel, by being baptized for the remission of sins, and that's what the Bible says. But when we live our life, we can get caught up in the joys of the world if you want to say it that way. And we can become stained again. And so we need to get that stain washed away through repentance and prayer. As a Christian, new Christian, we were clean. And as we go through life, sometimes we get dirty. And we need that blood of Christ to wash us away again. I want you to look at one more verse. 
One more text. I want us to go over to Titus chapter 3 and look at verses 3 through 8. Because this is exactly what we read a while ago, where Paul encourages Titus to carve away deficiencies, and that's what he wanted us uh, wanted, wanted to be preached. He said, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led away or led astray, slaves of, to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. Because of God's mercy, because of God's love, we can once again be pure and clean and white. The angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. And maybe there's someone here today that needs to do that very thing. If so, you need to make that decision now if you want to come and, and repent of those things and let the church pray with and for you. If you're watching online and, and you realize that you're not right in the eyes of God, let us know. Because we want to help you. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, come now as together we stand in the same.